Democrats currently hold a 0.4% advantage over the Republican Party in the generic ballot. But how would that reflect on this uh, Senate electoral map? In today's video, we will find out. Now, Republicans are at 38 seats initially, to Democrats at 28, which means Democrats need to defend far more seats than the Republican Party. I'm going to just start off with filling in the Democratic safe states because they are behind Washington, California. We're going to see the state of Delaware, the state of New Jersey, likely replacing incumbent Senator Bob Menendez and replacing it with probably Democrat Young Kim. Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, with Bernie Sanders, the independent senator who caucuses would be Democrats, the state of Maine with Angus King, the independent, also caucusing with the Democrats, and also the state of New York. We also have the state of Hawaii here, bringing Democrats to 39 seats. Republicans have safe seats in the states of Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, Nebraska's at-large and special election, Missouri, Indiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, and West Virginia. Now, West Virginia would be the first flip of this video and by a safe margin. We're likely going to see the state of West Virginia here go to the Republican Jim Justice, who won the Republican primary just a couple of weeks ago. Now, the state of West Virginia actually voted for a Democrat back in 2018, incumbent Senator Joe Manchin, who is not running for re-election, presumably, presumptively because he believes that he'll probably end up losing his Senate seat, which does bring the Republicans already to 48 seats. Now, for the likely Democratic states here, I'm going to start off with the state of New Mexico. Incumbent Martin Henrich is pretty well-liked and won by a pretty impressive 24% margin over Republican Mark Rich. Now, that was because Gary Johnson, the libertarian former governor of the state of New Mexico, got more than half of the vote compared to the Republican percentage, and he probably split away more of the Republican vote. But 54% for a Democrat is pretty good, especially because the Libertarian got such a high percentage of the total ballots. Therefore, I probably do expect the incumbent Democrat to easily win re-election. We're also going to see the state of Minnesota here with incumbent Democrat Amy Klobuchar, who was able to secure re-election by 24 points. Now, in this election, I do expect his margin, her margin to be halved, because in 2020, Biden only won the state by seven, and in the 2024 election, the state will probably be closer. Nevertheless, I do expect Amy Klobuchar to easily hang on by maybe double digits. I also think that Tim Kaine will be able to hang on in the state of Virginia here by a likely margin. He is a relatively well-liked senator who won by 16 points in his last election. Now, going to the more likely Republican states here, we really have two likely Republican states, starting off with the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, Ted Cruz back in 2018 in a more favorable environment for Democrats. In fact, Democrats won the Senate generic ballot by 20 points, partially because of the fact that the states that were up were super Democratic. Nevertheless, here we saw that Ted Cruz was only able to win by 225 215,000 votes over Beto O'Rourke, a much closer race than anticipated. Ted Cruz won by a safe margin back in 2012, but faced a fight for his life because Democrats did very, very well pretty much across the board. Beto O'Rourke did pretty much Biden numbers in the suburbs, did those Clinton numbers in some of these more his predominantly Hispanic counties, and also was a little bit more competitive in the rural areas. However, Ted Cruz this time will probably not face as strong of a challenge from Democratic Congressman Colin Allred, who although might make this is a bit stronger of a candidate compared to some other Democrats, he is definitely not the strongest candidate and certainly not better or work level. And the presidential race in which Trump is easily going to defeat Joe Biden may also hinder Democrats' effort to win the state of Texas, resulting in a likely margin or about 8% for Ted Cruz. The other likely Republican race here is the state of Florida. Florida was very competitive back in 2018, while incumbent Bill Nelson lost in a relative upset against uh, Republican Governor Rick Scott. Scott won by just 10,000 votes over Bill Nelson. A big problem for Democrats is pretty much in the state of Florida. Miami-Dade County trended heavily away from the Democratic Party and towards the Republicans. Hillary Clinton won Miami-Dade, the largest county in the state, by 30%. B Bill Nelson, the incumbent senator, won it by 21. But Joe Biden only won the county by 7 points, a 22% improvement for Republicans and Donald Trump, 
and the Republican Party was able to win Miami-Dade back in 2022 on both the Senate and Governor's level. The first time they've done that in several decades. And that is a problem for Democrats. They're not going to win the state of Florida. Florida is in the likely column for the Republican Party. Rick Scott will probably win by 8% over the Democratic challenger. Now, the remaining states on this map are at least remotely competitive. Republicans are already at 50 seats, while Democrats are at 42. Democrats need to run the board and to win the presidency in order to retain Senate control, while Republicans only need to win one seat or end up winning the presidency. Watch my presidential election prediction after you finish watching this one, which will pop up in the card right here. Anyways, the Republicans are at 50, and I'm going to go through the other states in alphabetical order, starting with the state of Arizona. In the Arizona Senate polling, Democrat Ruben Gallego, a more progressive Democrat, is currently leading Republican Carrie Lake, according to pretty much every single poll. We did see that Russ Mustin reports gave Carrie Lake an advantage, but Russ Mustin is not typically a considered a reputable poster, and therefore, if you look at the generic picture here, Ruben Gallego is ahead, and Carrie Lake is not necessarily the best candidate. In an election that was supposedly friendly to the Republicans, he lo she lost against Katie Hobbs, a Democrat who many people felt was unelectable, and frankly probably was, but Carrie Lake did not end up running the best campaign, losing Maricopa County, the, county, the state's largest county, by 38,000 votes. So as you can see, Kerry Lake is probably not the best candidate. But nevertheless, when we look at the state of Arizona, Joe Biden's probably going to lose his state, and split ticket voting is becoming less oft common in the general elections. However, nevertheless, Ruben Gallego, in my current projection, is nearly favored to win because Biden did win the state in 2020, so Democrats certainly have the support needed to win the state, and furthermore, it just does not look good too good for Carrie Lake. She is not a popular candidate, as demonstrated in 2022. It was a narrow but decisive de defeat for Carrie Lake, and it's hard for her to come back after the fact that Katie Hobbs was really a pretty terrible candidate on the Democrats' side. Now going to the next state in alphabetical order here, that would be, I believe, the state of, what is it, the state of Maryland, and I'm going to pull up the state of Maryland in the polls. Now in the state of Maryland here, in the Senate race, this one is surprisingly interesting. Joe Biden won the Maryland Senate race here, Maryland presidential race, by better than a 2 to 1 margin, or about 33%, or about just over a million votes, which means Larry Hogan has to pretty much flip away 500,000 Democrats and to end up having them vote for the Republican. Surprisingly, in the current polls, Democrats actually are is losing this race against Larry Hogan in some of the earlier polls, with Hogan leading by up to 18% in one of the pollsters. However, the most recent poll does have also Brooks up by 9, but that is Emily's List, a Democratic PAC. Anyways, the state of Maryland is definitely more competitive than what people initially thought, but the problem here is that Larry Hogan, though a popular governor in the state of Maryland, will probably not be able to overcome the partisan lean of the state. I mean, the state is so blue. We see some hugely Democratic counties such as Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Baltimore, right? These are heavily Democratic areas where Larry Hogan does not just have to make inroads, he has to pretty much cut the Democratic margin by at least half, if not more. And that is very challenging in a presidential election year, especially because Senate races are a lot more partisan than governor races. And therefore, I'm going to put this day in Maryland in the lean Democratic column, though it could move up to likely. Now the next state here that will be in the uh, pretty much the alphabetical list here is the state of Michigan. Michigan precedes the state of Maryland as another competitive race. Now what we see is that the incumbent uh, Repu uh, the, the incumbent Democrat Elisa Slotkin, not the incumbent, he she, uh, Gretchen Whitmer is retiring. But what we're seeing here, Debbie Stabenow is retiring. Sorry, but anyways, Elisa Slotkin, she is a relatively popular Democrat, and 
given that Michigan does have a historic Democratic lean, it does look better for the Democrats. However, Biden does have a tough election there in the state of Michigan, with polling does consistently suggest that Democrats are currently losing in the presidential race. Nevertheless, polling does also suggest that the Democratic Party is ahead in the Senate race. So, how much should we trust polling? Not very. But again, we do have a Democratic incumbent in the state of Michigan, and also this race, again, most pundits do have it in the lean Democratic column, which I do agree with. Michigan has a lot of blue suburbs, and that even though Trump may end up very well winning the state of Michigan, it just might not be enough for the Republicans to win it on the same ballot. Now going to the state of Montana, with it presenting a real challenge for the Democratic Party. In the state of Montana here, uh, that's Nebraska, sorry, in the state of Montana. Incumbent Democrat John Tester faces a fight for his life against Republican, uh, probably this Sherry candidate. Now, this race is very close. It can be back and forth, with uh, John Tester winning by about 3% and getting re-elected back in 2018. You might say that's really good, right? That's a good performance for incumbent. Well, there's a problem for John Tester. Back in 2018, 18, this was a Democratic wave where Democrats won the, back the House by like 20 seats. And that is a big problem for him in 2024 because this is a presidential year where politics is going to be a lot more polarizing. And again, Trump won the state by about 100,000 votes. You might say that's a small margin, but that's like a 16% margin. And that if anything, Biden is going to do worse than what he did in 2020. So that is a pretty steep road for John Tester to climb. John Tester is a tried and tested candidate, but will he be able to overcome such a big deficit? I'm not so sure. I don't think he will. He just needs to flip too many voters. I do believe that he'll convince many Republicans to vote for him and many independents, but it won't be enough. He'll probably still end up losing the race here by a margin of a couple, maybe 10,000 votes or so, or by about a lean margin of 3 to 4 percentage points. I do believe he'll significantly overrun Biden by about 12, but that won't be enough for him to win the state of Montana. Now going to the next state here, which will be the state of Nevada. The state of Nevada is definitely quite competitive between Jackie Rosen and what looks like to be Sam Brown. Now Jackie Rosen still has a consistent lead over the polls, but again the margins are relatively tight when he she, she is facing Sam Brown, pretty much the presumptive Republican nominee. This is still a relatively competitive race. Joe Biden won the state by 2.4%, but the, in the most recent New York Times slash Seattle College poll, J Joe Biden is down this, in the state by 12%. But at the same poll, you can see that Jackie Rosen is actually up by 2 against Sam Brown and tied with the likely voter group. So that looks a bit better for the Democratic Party in terms of Jackie Rosen's chances of winning the state of Nevada. I am pretty reluctant to care this race. Jackie Rosen is a pretty solid incumbent. She outseated the incumbent Republican Dean Heller in 2018 by 5%, but that is in a Democratic wave. And she did quite well in Clark County. She won by 15%. Generally, Democrats win the county by 78%, like Biden did. Biden won the county by about 9% back in 2020. Now, there, again, there are still some challenges facing Jackie Rosen, and this race is really closer to a coin flip. But just based on how much she's over overperforming Joe Biden, I'm going to have to give the state of Nevada here to Jackie Rosen by a tilt margin or by just a couple thousand votes. I do believe the presidential election will go red, but Jackie Rosen will hang on. That puts Democrats at 46 and Republicans at 51. Republicans are already in the majority. It just depends on how much of a majority they will have and how much room can Republicans end up losing in their own caucus. Now, the next state on my list is the state of Ohio. This is still a very competitive race. Joe Biden lost the state to Donald Trump by a margin of 8 percentage points. That being said, again, this is about a 500,000 vote margin, give or take a little bit. Nevertheless here, Sherrod Brown was able to win by a similarly impressive 7% margin over Jim James B. Renacci back in 2018, as Sherrod Brown won re-election by about 300,000 votes. 
The problem is running in a presidential election means less split ticket voting. And just looking at how well Trump was able to do in the rural areas is pretty frightening if you are Sherrod Brown. For example, I'm just going to take a random county, Williams County, about a 56, uh, 46% margin for the Donald Trump, a, a county that James Renacci only carried by about 20%. We go to the neighboring county of Defiance County, for example, that was a 16% Renacci County, and it voted for Trump by 37. Right, these are the type of overperformances that Trump is able to end up creating that a generic Republican cat. But on the same ballot, that is a problem for Sherrod Brown, who won by a relatively tight margin compared to what the polls expected. And if you look at the Ohio Senate race, sure, uh, Brown does still maintain a pretty large lead over over Monrino, who is the Republican. A big problem for the Republicans is that the candidate they they nominated to get essentially Bernie Monrino, he is not necessarily the most popular candidate. And many Democrats apparently voted for him in the Republican primary so that Sherrod Brown would have the best chance of winning re-election. However, that might very well backfire just because of the fact that the state of Ohio will probably vote for Trump by double, double digits in 2024, probably by about 11% margin. And someone like Sherrod Brown, although he is popular, he is not as popular as someone like, for example, John Tester of the state of Montana. Although he is able to get that cross-level appeal, it's not going to be enough for him to win the state. There's another problem here for Sherrod Brown. It's the fact that in 2012, running at the same ballot as a century Barack Obama, Sherrod Brown actually did not overrun Obama, signifying that he is not as strong in the state as some of the other more popular Democrats in the United States Senate who are actually able to get that large level of split ticket voting. Obviously, he'll still do better than, again, Joe Biden will do against Trump in the rural areas, but it's not going to be enough for him, in my opinion, to win the state of Ohio. I'm going to put it in the Republican column by a lean about a 2% margin. Now let's see Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is quite the opposite story of the state of Ohio. Again, we have a popular Democratic incumbent, Bob Casey, who is essentially an institution in the state. I know the polling is competitive, right? It's about a 5% victory for Bob Casey in most polls. However, there is again a problem for the Democrat Republican Party. Bob Casey has won pretty much all of his statewide elections by at least 7 points, and out of his, I believe, 6 bids for statewide office, only one was within single digits. Back in 2018, he won by a margin of about 15%, not necessarily a very narrow or small performance for Bob Casey against Lou Barletta, who was running against Doug Mastriano in the Republican primary for governor. Anyways, you can see how Bob Casey has a very consistent performance across the state. No matter if we go to a rural county, for example, Crawford County, Bob Casey lost that by 20 points, Joe Biden lost that by about 38 points, or if you go to another more, you know, suburban type of county, for example, Bucks County, right? Uh, Bob Casey was able to win it by 14, Joe Biden won, won it by about 4, to, to you know, a county that's more suburban, exurban, for example, Berks County, Bob Casey won it by 4, in 2020, Joe Biden lost it by 8, to even Philadelphia, right, Joe Biden was able to carry it by about 63, but that pales compares to Bob Casey's 74% win in that county. That just shows that Bob Casey is a very strong Democratic incumbent and probably going to be able to win. Dave McCormick is a more moderate candidate, someone who could resonate with more moderate voters in the suburbs around Philadelphia, especially in like a more traditionally conservative county like Chester, which voted for Biden by 17 despite being a traditionally more conservative county. However, that's not going to be enough. Bob Casey is an institution in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm going to right now put it in the lean column because I think that split ticket voting wouldn't be as prominent. But definitely Bob Casey is heavily favored in the state of Pennsylvania. Now the final state here is the state of Wisconsin with Tammy Baldwin. Some people believe that Tammy Baldwin may be in a little bit of trouble in, his own, in her own race. I really don't think so. Baldwin has been pulling about 8% over the Republican candidate who is not necessarily the most popular, right? There was one poll that showed them even, but I don't really take much into that because if Biden is able, is pretty much 
a tide in a state, there's no way that Tammy Baldwin ends up losing re-election. She won her re-election in 2018 by a margin of close to 11 points, doing very well in a county like Milwaukee, right, in the Democratic areas like Dane County, do very well in Ron Kine's previous district. But there was one area where she did not do as well in, that is the Wild Counties, right, Waukesha County. She lost that by 24, Biden lost it by 20. So that was the one area that she was not able to do well. That's a very populated suburb in the state. However, that type of area is heavily trending away from the Republican Party. We see Waukesha County, Ozaki County. These are the type of areas that Joe Biden did pretty well in. Combine that type of overperformance by Tammy Baldwin with the fact that she is able to appeal to a lot of, you know, uh, v- voters in the rural areas, a lot of working class voters, a lot of areas that are traditionally more, you know, conservative relatively urbanized areas like Brown County, right? We also look at Winnebago County or Portage County, right? You combine all those factors. It's difficult for t- for a Republican to defeat Tammy Baldwin in the state of Wisconsin. I have it as lean, lean Democrat, but in reality, again, Republicans, they have a very slim chance in the state of Wisconsin, just like they do in w- uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania. They are possible flips, but, but they are very unlikely. In conclusion, the Republican Party's chances of actually flipping the Senate are extremely high, as Democrats have to t- defend eight competitive seats and are pretty much guaranteed to lose the state of West Virginia. Democrats need to pretty much run the board in terms of the competitive races to have a chance of actually winning the Senate and retaining it. That being said, there's still a lot of competitive races. And also, the Rust Belt looks pretty good for the Democratic Party in general, except the state of Ohio. Really, Democrats could still win the Senate if they win Montana and Ohio, which is unlikely but not impossible. Republicans still have pickup opportunities in Nevada and Arizona, and they still have some chances in the Rust Belt, though their chances are not the best. 52 to 48 in favor of the Republicans is the most likely scenario, in my opinion. The Republicans could end up winning the seats in Nevada and Arizona to give them a 54 to 46 margin. Or Democrats could win the seats of Montana and Ohio and perhaps be able to retain the Senate with a 50-50 tie, just like in 2020. Anyways, thank you for watching today's video. Be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have a nice day. Goodbye.